Good. So sorry about the delay, people. Technology. So, um, hi, everyone. Um, but look, I haven't got any flash PowerPoint or anything. I just thought I would um, talk for a little bit and then I can answer any questions. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so, um, just um, the first thing to say is I don't know about you, but I, I suffer from um, uh, COVID amnesia, which is I find it really hard to remember anything that happened prior to the last lockdowns. <laughs> I don't know if others have had that experience, but I think it is a bit universal that, um, you know, we, we, we're actually finding it hard now to remember what happened right at the beginning when COVID mm. became a thing because, you know, we've coped and then we, you know, got to the next down lockdown and we cope and we go on. So so it actually is um, quite hard to remember exactly. Um, and I think it's one of the things we're dealing with now is people have forgotten. Um, and um, so people are getting a little bit, uh, uh, you know, lax about some things, I think. We forgot at the beginning, but so if I could just um, go back to the beginning um, and just get a little bit of background about what it was like. Um, I, I think one of the things that we forget is that right at the beginning we didn't know what we know now uh, about COVID, and I can remember in the February before COVID hit of 2020, uh, sitting in our um, meeting room with the senior. Um, leadership team and um, saying to the person who was in charge of um, infection control, what's this about this virus? Is this something we should be really concerned about here? Is there anything we need to do differently to what we ordinarily do? Because of course, in a care facility setting, we're doing infection control. We always have all the time. It's not anything new for us to try and keep um, diseases out or to stop um, you know, infections from spreading. We do that all the time. And so the person said, oh, well, I'm keeping an eye on what's coming through from the Ministry of Health. Um, I think we just need to keep up our normal practices um, and, you know, we, we should be fine. So that was like February. And then all of a sudden we're locked down. And I look back on that and go, did we miss something? Or, you know, we're we not paying enough attention. But I think it's just an example of how quickly it went from, something we should be vaguely concerned about to this is a, a major pandemic across the whole world that none of us alive have ever experienced um, previously. So it moved very, very quickly. And I think that's something to remember when people are looking back and um, I guess reflecting on you know, leadership is that in, in actual fact, things went very fast um, and we didn't have all the information at, at the start. Um, I do remember, and I don't think I'll ever forget the moment when the Prime Minister announced that we were going into a national lockdown. Um, I was actually walking down the corridor in our um, Howitt care facility, and someone said, the Prime Minister's on TV, and we raced back down to the dining room and we put the TV on and we listened to it. And the minute she said the words, you know, I'm, you know, we're going into a national lockdown as of, you know, two days, I thought, okay, if, we, if it's that serious, then we should just lock down now. And so I went out and said, okay, everyone, this is what's happening, we're locking down. And I do remember I then walked into my office and um, I felt a little overwhelmed by the responsibility that was suddenly in front of me because I realised that, um, you know, I had overarching responsibility for the safety of a whole lot of very vulnerable older people and also all the staff. Um, and so I stood there for a moment and I felt very overwhelmed. And um, I rang my husband actually and went, oh, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed. And he went, yep. Um, <laughs> and um, then I put the phone down and thought, get a grip. You're not the prime minister. <laughs> You're just the leader of a, of a care you know, organization. So get a grip and um, get on with it. And so that's what we did. I went out and we, the senior team all came together and we just started our process of um, you know, planning what we would do. Uh, but I don't think I'll ever forget that, that moment. And you know, it was a time where 
as leaders, you did have to step up, even though, you know, frankly, we didn't really know what it was we were going to be facing. So um, it was a time to step up. Um, so something else I want to just say is I, I remember hearing comments uh, from people about, you know, all the everyone's just making it all up as they go along. You know, the government's just making it up as they go along. And, and quite frankly, we were, um, and the government was, and everyone else was. And that's because um, no one alive had ever dealt with this before. So the last pandemic, you know, was 1918. Or, and, and, you know, basically no one alive who was in leadership and government anywhere um, had ever dealt with this before. And, um, and so we were, to a certain extent, making it up as we went along. Um, it was really interesting about three weeks into the pandemic. I remember that I did actually have a pandemic plan because it's part of our requirement for the DHB. So I went and had a look at it and I sort of read it and then closed it and put it to the side because it had actually been planned for a completely different type of um, pandemic, a flu pandemic where uh, it was a much slower um, spread and, um, you know, we already had vaccinations and et cetera. And so really lots of us had plans, but they were in the end not much use because COVID was so different and because we didn't have vaccination, um, which, you know, made a huge difference. So, so when I hear people go, you know, oh, everyone was making it up, I'm like, yep, <laughs> because that's the way it was. Yeah. You know, we just had to... Um, learn as we went and, and change what we did. Um, one of the things that became really important for me and the whole team here was that we decided very early on what I called a single point of truth, um, a single source of information about COVID and what we should do that we listen to. Um, and we made that the Ministry of Health uh, because you probably remember there was so much information coming at us all from lots of different sources, um, you know, international and local, and lots of people had opinions about what we should all do and what was the best thing to do and how to do it. And it was just too much information. And so we kind of went, um, okay, um, it's the Ministry of Health and they're not going to get everything 100% right, but essentially we could trust them to be trying to get it as right as possible. Um, and that made a huge difference because we just ignored everything else that was coming our way. And if the Ministry of Health um, briefings that we got sent um, said it, then, then that was um, what we did or, or what we took into account. Um, and, and that was really, really important to do. And I think um, as individual people as well, it was helpful to just go, I'm only going to listen to, you know, this reliable um, source of information. And again, when I reflect back, I think we're very lucky to live in New Zealand um, through a pandemic because um, whatever you might think about the political parties, because when I talk about government, I mean the civil service, not just the politicians, we do. We know from studies that we have um, a very, very low rate of um, corruptibility. So we can basically trust our civil service, um, and you know they're not perfect, but they're actually there to try and do a good job. And so we're very lucky like that. There are many countries in the world where you couldn't trust what the government or the the health people were telling you because um, it was very political and, and people were saying what they were told to say. Whereas in New Zealand, um, we were lucky that the Ministry of Health was able to say it as they understood it. I think we we're also lucky that we did have um, politicians who were happy to listen to science and to medical experts uh, and to base the advice um, that we got on, on that, which was absolutely not true in many countries in the world where they were basing it on, um, you know, what was really going to do them the best politically rather than, you know, the science. So, so I think we were quite lucky in that. Um, I think we're also lucky um, that we moved very quickly in this country to take action. And that really helped us here. Uh, I think if, you know, if we hadn't gone to lockdown as early, 
um, all those kinds of things, it could have been much more difficult for those of us trying to care for vulnerable people. So, so I feel as a leader that I was probably in one of the best places in the world. Um, if you had to lead through a pandemic, this was one of the best places in the world to do it because we did have the support. It, it absolutely wasn't perfect, but it was pretty good. Um, another thing I think that was really um, that people need to remember about the pandemic and those of us who were leading is dealing with the pandemic was hugely detailed. It was just enormously complex and detailed. What might look like really minor decisions could take an hour to make a decision about how we would, would go with it, you know. Um, and so, you know, we could spend a whole morning making a number of what seemed like very small decisions but as you unpicked them they had big implications in terms of safety for staff and for residents and clients um, and you know implications for having enough staff to care and all sorts of things so um, it, it really was a time of huge complexity and detail um, and I think what we learned through that was um, just really some skills at kind of really honing in on what was most important to be thinking about uh, and trying to let, you know, the stuff on the periphery um, go a bit, but it was hugely detailed. Um, the other thing that I can remember from the, um, the pandemic is that um, communication was really, really important as a leader. Um, communicating with the staff, obviously, with residents, with family members. Um, people were really hungry to know what's happening, how is it happening, how is it working, what's going on. So we needed to do uh, much more communication than we normally would have. Uh, and really, as a leader, communicating became one of the things that was most important for me to do, um, was to front very clear communication um, out to everyone who needed to know things. The, uh, it's an ongoing thing for us here. So um, the pandemic, I know out in the community, there is a bit of a feel like it's at an end and lots of things have changed. But for those of us who are um, leading organisations that care for vulnerable people, um, in a sense, the pandemic is still um, there for us. So today we've got one of our care facilities locked down uh, because we have a few cases of COVID in the facility and the people who live in that particular facility are not people we can expect to just stay in their rooms until they're through COVID. They're, they're, they're not able to understand that that's what they need to do. So they're going to wander around. So we have to lock down the whole facility. Um, so that's happening off and on all the time still for us. We have a few cases, we need to decide what to do. We either keep people in their rooms if that's viable or we um, lock down a particular community or we have to lock down a whole facility for a few days. And so um, that is going to be our life until I think there is annual vaccination that can cope with all the variants um, that are coming through. It, it's still a live issue for us. Uh, so lots of the world has moved on, um, but for those of us in care services, um, it's still very much something that we are on a daily basis just managing and, and needing to lead through. To be a bit more positive, there were some positives that came out of COVID. Um, and uh, so it wasn't all bad. I think we, we actually learned some things uh, that we've actually been able to keep using even now, even though we're you know, not in the thick of it. So one of the things that was actually really positive about COVID is that um, it became really clear to everyone what their job was. You know? um, so people knew instantly that their job was to keep everyone safe and um, to keep our residents and our clients safe from COVID as much as we could, uh, to keep it away from vulnerable people. And I think especially at the beginning, before we had vaccination, you know, that was our only way of protecting people was to keep COVID out. Uh, and so staff became very, very focused. And I think um, it really kind of showed the power of a 
single organizing goal um, mm-hmm. in, in an organization. If, if we knew exactly why we were there and what we were there to do. Um, so, you know, that was a good, um, a good learning lesson. Um, the staff were very united. Um, and I think, you know, which was great to see. It's not to say that they're not always like that, but I think people were particularly united um, and just wanted to um, do that job of keeping people safe. So it was actually a really nice time to lead because um, you can imagine in organisations there's always a bit of issues, but really there were few issues uh, during the worst of COVID because um, everyone was just really, really focused on, on that goal of keeping people safe. I think some people who were natural leaders amongst our staff who might not have had formal leadership roles, but they're just natural leaders, they really came forward in COVID. Um, you, you saw the people who knew how to um, uh, organise their colleagues, you know, work with their colleagues, you know, reassure their colleagues um, and get things done really came to the fore. And so um, we've actually, you know, promoted and expanded the roles of quite a few people um, since COVID because during COVID we really saw who those natural leaders in the organisation were. So that was that was really good. And I think the use of technology, learning to use technology, like we're doing today when it works, um, um, <laughs> that was a real learning. I mean, really, I prior to COVID, I'd done a few Zoom meetings, um, but we really were in the, you had to be in person to meet with someone. Um, and we just had to do a crash course in technology when, um, when COVID hit. And... Um, and, I, and that was really good. I mean, we have really um, been able to use the efficiency of, um, of things like Zoom and, te- and other technology, um, you know, and we'll keep doing that. And, you know, I think Virtual Village, for example, um, we discovered that actually the virtual bit um, on computer was actually quite good for a lot of things. Um, we might have got there without COVID, but I think it would have taken us a lot longer to adopt a lot of this technology. So I think that kind of crash course in technology um, was actually, you know, really one of the real positives that will be lasting um, out of COVID. Um, and certainly as a leader, um, I, you know, it's changed the way I can do um, a lot of my work. Um, because everyone's comfortable with using um, technology a lot more than they were before COVID. Um, For the residents, there were also some positives. I mean, people were quite worried about residents, not only that they catch COVID and and die, but also that, you know, loneliness and isolation. And there certainly was some of that, but I think um, particularly for people who were in residential care or retirement villages, um, there was also a sense that they weren't alone. Uh, that they had that support around them. And again, the technology um, expanded um, some opportunities for residents. So for example, people were able to, um, we introduced video calling because people couldn't come in. And that meant people could talk to like grandchildren who were living overseas, maybe for the first time in a long time and um, actually see them. Um, And, you know, we had some delightful stuff because, you know, we had some 90 year olds who'd never done a video call before and um, I remember one of them was looking at it and she thought it was a photo of her um, granddaughter and she and then the granddaughter moved and she went oh it moves you know (laughs) and but you know it was lovely that she was able to connect with where she hadn't really spoken to that granddaughter for you know a a long long time so you know there were some positives and we discovered a few things like um, residents said they really appreciated not having visitors during meal times um, because when visitors would arrive during meal times previously they'd feel they had to rush their meal um, so that they can go and spend time with the person who turned up to visit them. So we've kept that and we've actually asked people now not to visit over um, the lunch and the dinner hour um, because residents have said actually we really appreciated just being able to take our time and and do that. So so it hasn't all been um, negative. Um, And I think, you know, as a a leader, um, you know, one of the things was to 
to acknowledge the um, concern and the fear and, um, and, and all that side of things, but also to say to people, but hey, here's the things that we have got out of it that are actually quite positive. So, you know, we haven't been left in a worse place. In fact, in some ways, I think um, we've been, you know, obviously preferred not to go through it, uh, but we have actually gained some really positive things from the experience as well. So I'm going to leave it there and I'm open to um, any questions that I can answer. I'm not a clinical expert, so don't ask me about the science or uh, anything like that. But. Any questions? I'll start. Oh, okay. Somebody else starting. No? Right. Um, something that comes through to me from all that you've said there, Bonnie, I think of people that I know in other retirement village situations, and many of them, it sounds like it was really horrible. And it's what that's saying to me, and it's tied up with a lot of what you said, that you seem to have an advantage at your place um, because you are private, for want of a better description, not beholden to shareholders, perhaps, is a better way of putting it, um, not having to be accountable to shareholders and not losing money that way. And I think you're lucky. And I think also the whole, perhaps to me, knowing a very small amount about the Eden alternative, that comes through as well. Um, you know, you hear the, the lady from um, Elizabeth Knox advertising on the radio and yep. what she says is the same as what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I think the Eden philosophy and the way we operate because of that um, really did help significantly with COVID. So for those who don't know, Eden Alternative is a philosophy of care, which is... Um, all about you know making our um, care facilities as close to home as possible and as far away from an institution. And one of the things that we do here as part of Eden is we don't call them wards, we call them communities. So we try and operate by community as much as possible. So consistent staff as much as you can by community. The communities do lots of things together. Um, so we do operate like activities that go across the whole facility, but there's a lot of stuff that just happens in each community. So when we went into lockdown, we actually bubbled within our big bubble. So the whole facility was locked down, but each community also locked down and there was no crossing over. Um, now, if we hadn't already been operating by community, that would have been really difficult because there wouldn't have been that sense of community. But I think because there was already a sense of community and they feel like a, a big family in their community, um, that was okay, you know, for people. And also they did quite, in some ways, they quite enjoyed it because they really got to know each other really well, staff and, and residents in each community. So I think that was an advantage. Um, we didn't have to try and create that from scratch. It was already there. Mm -hmm. um, so we just, you know, could, could build on that. So yeah, I think that did really help us. Um, certainly being a non-profit, I mean, obviously we have to make money because we have to pay bills, um, but um, all our money goes into our services and you're right, we don't have shareholders going, you know, what's happening to my, um, you know, my share value. Um, I do think a lot of providers did their best, but um, to some extent it was good planning and good leadership and to some extent it was luck, like, if we had had really large numbers of staff going off with COVID all at once, um, it, no, man, no, no amount of good leadership um, could have dealt with that because there was no one to replace them. Mm. So, um, you know, I do know places where um, they just got hit hard and they got hit hard early and... Um, really there was nothing much they could do about it and and one of the problems mm. was, you know the DHBs um didn't had the same problem and so the, you know it was really tricky but but certainly I think Eden um just really helps because we had that structure already and we you know we could just keep on going with that 
Anyone else got a question? Not a question, just a, a, a thought. When you said about the residents rushing through their meals so that they could see their visitors, and yeah. it took me back to when I was visiting my own mother in a facility, and they would be allowed to um, invite one of their friends or family to come and have the lunch with them or whatever. But it's a it's a lovely idea that um, yes, I never gave it a thought that by by um, arriving at lunchtime to share a lunch with mum that all the background effort that had to go into that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And I think it's it's also like we try and think about, you know, if this, you know, if this was an ordinary home, you know, so you're in your house and your community, um, you either invite people to dinner or you invite or people come after dinner. Yes. You don't generally get people arriving at dinner time unannounced you know like um because that's just not done because you kind of know that people want to eat their dinner and then it might yes. be okay to turn up you know and and so I think it's it, it what we realized was we still had an institutional view around meal times and we needed to change that and educate families to say well you know um if you wouldn't have ordinarily turned up at dinner time when mum was in her own place you know, maybe don't do it here. Um, people can share a meal if, if they pre-book, because obviously we've got to do numbers. But, um, but you know, it, it was also like it's convenient for family members often to visit at five o'clock because it's after work. So meals are early here, unfortunately. Um, but then, you know, that, that disrupts that. So it was just one of the little learnings. And look, we're not 100% rigid about it, but we just try and encourage people not to um, to come in it, but I think it was just an example that, again, we might have got to that without COVID, but COVID kind of sped up some of these learnings that we were um, starting to make anyway. So you know, so it wasn't a an all negative experience. Um, yes, that's great. Hmm. Any any other questions? I'll have another go. Um, like many people, I've got uh, conspiracy theorists and anti-vaxxers and so on in the family. Um, how did you get on with staff and or residents who actually were reluctant to be vaccinated? Or was that not an issue? Um, so it's a good question. Um, so we were lucky in some ways in that, you know, vaccination was mandated for our staff. So, you know, it was essentially you need to get vaccinated or you can't work here. Having said that, we didn't want to lose staff because we weren't in a position to replace them if they left. So um, for residents, it was a choice. They didn't have to. Um, what we found with residents was the vast majority were completely happy to do it. And that was partly because this age group remember the last polio outbreak. Mm. Um, a lot of them, like um, my mother, if she was alive, would be 87. And um, I can remember her telling me about the last polio outbreak. And she can remember turning up to school. They had to go and stand in the um, field, um, not close to anyone. The teachers went round and dropped some books at their feet. And then they didn't go back to school for several weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and my mother-in-law remembered it too. And so... Um, you know, a lot of this age group just said, you know, thank goodness for vaccination because we can remember what it was like when there was no vaccination. We had a few that didn't want to um, and we just needed to respect that. Um, but we did have to say to people, you know, if we got a COVID outbreak and you're not vaccinated, then you are probably going to be isolating in your room until it's over because vaccination is really our first line of defence. Um, with staff, we did. We had very few that didn't want to. We had some that were reluctant, um, and um, we just tried to talk the science through with people, really. Um, and um, we did some. Some of us sat through some training um, that was out on on the vaccination because I think the thing that worried a lot of people was. Um, historically vaccines take a long time to be developed and then rolled out mm -hmm. and people wanted to understand 
how can it be safe when it's happened so quickly? You know, and the fundamental answer was if every vaccine had as much money and resource thrown at it as this vaccine had, they'd all come out this quickly. You know, mm -hmm. the only reason that vaccines are slow is they usually, you know, they, there's all these phases and normally people are having to continually find money before they can start the next phase of development. Whereas with COVID, you know, they actually ran all the phases, but they could run them almost in parallel and they knew they had the money for, the, for whatever they needed to do. And so that enabled people to develop it really quickly. So that was one thing we were able to talk through with people was it is safe, you know, and every vaccine would be this fast if people had the money. Um, and the other thing was just talking through the fact, you know, because it was an RNA vaccine, so a little bit different to some of the older vaccines, but just trying to talk people through what that meant, you know, and RNA is not DNA and, you know, all those kinds of things. Now, this is where I can't talk that through. I didn't do that kind of discussion. But, you know, just tried to give people um, the scientific facts and, um, and talk, talk them through that. Um, we did have, you know, we had a very, very tiny number of staff who just went, I'm just not going to do it. Um, and... Um, you know, we, we but we actually only lost in the end one staff member um, because of vaccination. So, so we, you know, we were quite lucky there. Um, and, you know, and I can understand, you know, I can, I can remember in my head when I first heard that the vaccine was going to be ready, I thought, oh my goodness, that's really fast. I'm not sure if I want to be the first off the rank on this. But, and I had to educate myself. Um, because I'm not a I'm not a clinical person I'd educate myself and and then I felt quite assured and then the other thing for me was um, to just go well you know the alternative is you know getting COVID and potentially dying so you know when I weighed up the risks for myself I was like I think the statistical risk of um, being harmed by COVID was way higher than the statistical risk of the vaccine. Um, so we just tried to gently educate people and we did it quite gently, you know, one-on-one -on -one, um, talking through with people and um, also getting maybe colleagues who'd been hesitant, who'd gone and got vaccinated to go and talk to people. Um, but I think we were lucky. And, and look, we are a health-based service. So one would hope the majority of the staff would be looking at the health information, but People do have their own personal fears. And, you know, if you've had a bad reaction in the past or anything like that, you can you can understand it. And we had one staff member and, you know, I take my hat off to him, very brave. He has his whole life had severe reactions to vaccines, so much so that when he has them, he has to actually be in a hospital A&E department. Um, and, and he went and got it done, you know. Um, and I was just like, you know, woohoo to him because, um, you know, if you've had that lifelong actual medical severe reactions, that, that's very brave. So, so I think the other thing was a lot of people did it, even if they didn't want to do it, they did it for the residents. They, they didn't want to be the person who brought COVID in. And so they, they did it for the, the residents. So. Mm, that's lovely. Anything else? No, no. And, and we, we were the guinea pigs because we got vaccinated before anybody else. So, mm. you know, my whole, my whole family were going, so how was it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and looking, but, um, you know, it was all fine. And, and I think, yeah, you know, there will be an annual vaccination coming. Mm. Uh, you'll probably get it with your flu shot. Um, and um, that will be what saves us from, you know, potential more big lockdowns will be annual, annual vaccination. So, um, and look, I know people have their own opinions on it. And, and all I would say is if um, gently, gently does it, if you really try and um, uh, get strong and hard with people who are anti-vax, they just won't listen. You just have to offering them opportunities to see information 
and, mm -hmm. and come to that themselves. And it does help if someone who was previously hesitant or anti has changed their mind can have that conversation because they understand where that person is coming from, you know, and what the shifts they've had to make in their mind uh, to, to get to that point. So, yeah. One of the things that fascinated me, and I'm not a, a clinical person in any shape or form, was the vaccination and the new technology and how it was targeting the COVID virus. Hmm. Whereas others have been more generic, haven't they, from what way I understand it? Yeah. So I guess that was something in its favour, that it was actually targeting something, not the general... Um, uh, um, yeah, and I mean, that was one of the reasons I could have the vaccine. I, I have a medical condition. I take some medication and I'm not allowed to have any live vaccines. And a lot of the old vaccines are kind of live in the sense of, you know what um they they have a, an element of the disease in them uh and that's what your immune system reacts to and builds up and i can't have any live vaccines so the fact that it was an rna vaccine that just targets the covid um spikes meant that people such as myself could actually have that vaccine um and one of the great things about the new vaccine technology is and there have always been people who can't have some of the vaccines for some of the older diseases. Uh, mm -hmm. But with this new technology coming through, they're probably going to have new vaccines for some of the old diseases as well, that people who've got um, immune conditions are going to be able to have. So, you know, um, go science, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, if I'd known at high school that science could be this world changing, I might have paid more attention. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, my uh, one of my sister-in-laws is a um, research scientist uh, who's an expert in diseases of the throat and mouth. So um, she, like a lot of scientists across the world, was taken off her research that she was doing and just put completely on COVID mm. um, research. So I mean, I think this is one of the things that people need to understand is that there were thousands of scientists working on this um, and the degree of collaboration across the world was probably the most it's ever been about anything um, including HIV and there was um, you know enormous collaboration about HIV when that first hit but this has just been enormous amount of collaboration across the world um, to come up with solutions so I hope that Keeps going. So, yeah. so from this RNA uh, type of technology, I guess we can see huge advances there as a fallout from the COVID research. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, you know, that's why I say, you know, obviously it would be much better for the world if we'd never had to go through COVID because the things we're experiencing now, which is, you know, like inflation, and et cetera. I mean, it's all attributable back to the pandemic. There's, you know, I don't, it, it's not that, people have um, got the economies wrong across the world, you weren't going to go through three years of a pandemic without it affecting, you know, lots of things. But um, but it wasn't all negative. There's some positive stuff that's come out that, you know, science and and, and things that we've learned. So, mm. yeah. Mm. All right. Let's pop my head in. Is, is there any, any other questions, anything? Can I make a unrelated comment that uh, I appreciate Bonnie's attendance this morning and also to wish her all the very best in her new role and her new organisation and I think you're going to be very sorely missed at uh, HBH. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, yes I, um, I was going to say this is probably the last time I've presented Virtual Village although you dragged me back. Yeah, well. <laughs> Oh, you know, uh, it's dear to my heart, Virtual Village, so um, hopefully I can keep the connection. And I'm already thinking about ways that Virtual Village can connect with my new organisation. So, yes, for those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm leaving at the end of January. I'm going to be the Chief Executive at Presbyterian Support Northern. Um, so um, this is my 11th year at HBH, so... Um, I don't think they can complain too much of where they are. Um, but um, And it was a really hard decision. 
it was a really hard decision to to leave because it's very much like family and um you know fantastic place and lots still more to do but um you know this opportunity came up and um and presbyterian support is kind of part of my um heritage because i am a presbyterian <laughs> Um, raised Presbyterian, etc. So, um, so I've taken the opportunity to um, to move on, but we'll absolutely keep the connection. And um, one of the things Presbyterian Sport done is, is it, it has a very large home support service called Enliven, and uh, I can see lots of opportunities to connect home support services with the virtual village. Um, mm. And you know that I think there's probably lots of people getting home support services who would really benefit from being linked into something like the virtual village. So I'm already plotting, you know, <laughs> to, to find the linkages. You can blame Eden. You can blame Eden on that because if they are family, it's through your Eden concept. So it's all your fault. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. But um, but look, I, I just want to say thanks to those of you who've supported mm. the virtual village and keep turning up to things. Um, um, hopefully with our half time extra uh worker here we'll be able to move things forward even faster but i do think you know it's still a really important thing that we work to make sure that people are connected and um have friendship and support mm -hmm. so um but that doesn't happen with us it only happens if if you guys um turn up and, and support it so you know so i do really appreciate especially those of you who've been in the in from the beginning and hung in there um, and I do think, you know, the virtual village is going to just go from strength to strength. Mm. Um, and, you know, that was one of the hard decisions was to leave the virtual village behind because um, mm. I feel like there's lots to do. But, yeah, I'll definitely stay connected. And um, I'm sure you'll see me again at some point. Um, I'll come and talk to you about once I know what my job is. I'll come <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should be looking at the community concept for virtual village because if you're moving to a, should we say, a western region um, under the auspices of virtual village east, that we have a community based groupings like we have here on Zoom right at this very moment, that um, maybe there's room for the community uh, concept. We are working on expanding mm. to other areas, so watch the space. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. yes. So de definitely looking to expand. So, mm. Yeah. Yeah. Because we think it can go to other other areas. So yeah, Presbyterian Support Northern covers Taupo North. So um, <laughs> with the <laughs> services. So yeah. But I've got a big team. Uh, there's a thousand staff. So um, so it's a big team. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Anyway, yes. hand back to Lee. Yes, uh, I've got nothing more to say, really, just to thank Bonnie for her time. Um, and, um, yes, I look forward to seeing you all, some of you, tomorrow. And thanks for joining us, and take care. See you soon. What a walk. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bonnie. Bye-bye. Thanks, Lee. Cheerio.